everybody. Is, is it is it coming through? I think I'm supposed to be on. Everybody in the back kind of here clearly enough? Great. Um, if not, just start waving your arms and, and uh, I'll make adjustments. Um, uh, the, the reason for this format, frankly, is that um, Hal is right. I've been um, kind of lecturing for, for a number of years on, on projects and, and there's a couple of things I began to sort of realize. I, I think when I was a student, um, some of the most difficult lectures I went to is when the architects just were droning on about these projects, and I wasn't particularly interested in it. And I, in fact, I wanted to ask questions because I was full of questions about. So, what the heck is really the practice of architecture about? What am I really walking into? And um, I think you know your professors have probably one of the most difficult proje uh, projects, and frankly jobs in the world, and that's to try to move architects out of you. It's virtually impossible in the few years that they're spent uh, working with you. Really, the practice of architecture is truly um, a practice that you have to engage in and you have to participate in. It's almost like an apprenticeship program. And because of that, you have to look at your academic career as something that is barely getting you started to get in, if you're going into practice, into the practice of architecture. And I think as you get older, you're just going to realize that more and more, uh, that as you develop it into an architect, you're going to realize you know less and less and less about uh, more and more and more. And it's kind of an interesting process. I didn't believe it was the truth, but I, I can tell you, after doing it now for, I guess, close to 30 years, um, I, um, I, can, I can at least say to you that it, it's a process that's unbelievably exciting, but it's also unbelievably difficult. Uh, the second reason I, I like this format is that I'm just um, kind of tired of talking about my projects. Um, I, you know, I've been with them now for some of them for, well, most of the ones you're going to see tonight kind of came at a particular period on. And they're kind of in chronological order when we start looping uh, the images behind me. Um, and really my breakthrough happened when I was probably about 38 years old, 35 years old. When I, before I was 38 or 35, I don't think I was really an architect. You know, I kind of was licensed. I kind of was working in a firm. I was actually spending a lot of time in the mountains and spending a lot of time doing other things. It wasn't the complete commitment until I was about uh, early 30. And then it, it took me a while to kind of go through that apprenticeship program to ultimately become what I think of an architect. So really, uh, the work you're going to see is work that I've personally been doing uh, since uh, I think it's about 86, 1986 to uh, some current projects. Some of those current projects you see as sketches, some of them you'll see as under construction. That's, in, uh, that's intentional because obviously my life is about making art, making architecture, and it's a full-time job. Um, so what I want to do tonight is give you, especially for students, I want to give students something that I wish um, maybe uh, an architect had, had done for me as a student. I was kind of lucky because I, I grew up in a situation that maybe some of this was familiar to me. Uh, my dad's an architect and actually um, I grew up around architects and I grew up around artists and I'll get to that in a second. But um, I wish um, somebody would have said that my youth uh, and my early adulthood were probably the most important sources of inspiration for me uh, doing architecture. If this makes sense to you, I don't know if it makes sense to you. I don't even know if it would have made sense to me a, a, as a student. But um, what, what I've learned now, and I, I just recently turned 60 years old and I've been at this for a while, I, I've been learning for the last 15, 20 years is really what I'm doing now is sort of nuanced development of some of the experiences I had as a student, my professors, um, the, the experiences outside of the culture of architecture, and I want to make an um, emphatic point about that. Some of the most important influences for me were outside of architecture. They were outside of architecture as a business, they were outside of architecture as an academic pursuit. They were, I, I actively pursued other, other interests, and I think you all should remember it's not always about architecture. Architecture is this kind of fantastic profession that grabs things from all sorts of different realms. And in order to sort of understand those realms, you, for your own personal biases or direction, 
have to figure out what those what those uh, directions are and what those influences will ultimately become. Again, I'm saying these things to you. You may not believe them. I think you will as you as you're developing a personal sort of vision of architecture. Let me talk about that a little bit. If you're interested in a personal vision of architecture, let me tell you something that I learned was that if I overstudy magazines, if I overstudy projects, if I overstudy and sort of use those as, as sort of templates, I'm actually doing other people's work, if that makes sense. What I ultimately had to figure out was what really drives me from my heart, from my soul, and of course use those influences to hopefully assemble them into an architecture of the now, I kind of hope that makes sense. Because uh, some people will come up to me and, and say, well, I, you know, I saw one of your projects, and I love this project, and you know, I used it for a project that I did. Well, I kind of hate to, you know, <laughs> I kind of hate to break the news, but if, you're, if you actually see a project that's just published or just won an award, you're actually looking at a project that's about four or five years old. I'm already in a different place for a different thing based on some of my Does that make a sense to everybody else? I hope it does. Um, and again, it may not make sense yet, but I think at some point it's going to make a lot of sense to you guys. We're located up in um, Seattle, Washington. Hopefully uh, some of you have visited Seattle. It's a beautiful place. It's a beautiful place like Des Moines. I have to say, this city was so impressed. Cal took us around. What you guys have going on in, in the downtown area is so exciting. I wish we had that kind of urban development, that kind of urban commitment as what um, happening here in Des Moines. We don't in, in, in um, uh, Seattle, but we are located downtown right by the football stadium. Please join us uh, when you can. Um, we're a firm, and this is hard to believe also, we're a firm of about 120 people. And for Jim and I, that's shocking. When I joined the firm in 1986, there were about seven of us, and we were actually going bankrupt. The thing to understand about architecture, especially students, is that the um, I'm standing up here kind of representing a bunch of the work that maybe I led as a principal, but really what I'm, I'm lucky to be standing here talking about them, but all of these projects have the DNA of a bunch of people in our firm, certainly the DNA of the client. That's something you will begin to sort of begin to, under, or begin to understand as you go into practice, that in fact the clients are enormously influential in the work um, and the craft people are one of the best sources of material tectonic information that you can get. I can guarantee you will get better tectonic information from a crafts person that knows their craft than another architect like myself that's been at it for a number of years or an academic institution. It's impossible not to get better information than uh, from a crafts person. So what you're looking at here is my uh, partners, um, uh, that's Kirsten Murray on my right, uh, Jim Olson founded the firm in 1969, and then Alan Maskin um, on Jim's left. This is where the firm is. Uh, this is, we're kind of in a funny, we're kind of in a funny zone area, and this is one reason I feel pretty comfortable working in virtually any type of landscape, is that we're on the wet side of what's called the wet side of the mountain, West, wet side of uh, the Cascades. Everybody thinks it rains all the time in, in Seattle. It actually doesn't rain that much, but it is cloudy. It's a maritime um, climate. Uh, but I didn't grow up in that neighborhood. I, I kind of grew up in what's called the inner mountain area, the high desert. Uh, it's uh, basically true four seasons like you have here in Iowa. Very cold in the winter. Uh, very hot in the summer. It's probably less humid there. It is a high desert. But as a kid who was not interested in architecture as a kid, but I was more interested in sort of the landscape I was growing up in. I loved, I loved my surroundings. Probably the most influence, the highest influence in my career is the landscape I grew up in. Uh, so some of the rainforests in the deep before, uh, valleys of, uh, of the mountainous region and of course the mountains. But my, uh, my immediate um, landscape around my city was a lot like what you might recognize here in Iowa and Nebraska. It's the, it's the big sky, big plain, big farm um, uh, landscape. And, and I think what I, 
I, I'm speculating here, but I think what I came out of with that experience was when you're in that landscape, you're actually a pretty darn small part of it. And you begin to understand our place, human, in that landscape. And you begin to understand that the, that the perspective is the context rather than the person. Even if there's a relatively significant building in that landscape, like let's say a six or seven story uh, brain tower or something like that, in that context, it's a relatively small piece. I think for me, in, in the architecture that I'm always trying to do, it's the context of the situation. It's the cultural context, economic context, landscape context. It's what the driver is for, for the building. The building is kind of a, a result of all those contexts coming together. I said I, I, you know, I, I love the mountains. I actually spent a lot of time in the mountains. Um, in fact, I, uh, I sort of went into I went into architecture to sort of support a mountain climbing career. And it turns out that the mountains actually were a significant part of my career because I was lucky enough to learn how to climb mountains with some of the best mountain climbers in the world, John Roskelly and Chris Kalpinski. And what I learned from John and Chris, I still use today, which is learn your tools to the point where you just know how to use them almost without even thinking about it. It's just like learning a sport. It's like learning how to draw. It's like learning how to make music. It's like learning how to write. Learn your tools to the point where you don't even have to think about using your tools. And that certainly was driven hard into me about mountain climbing. It was not about getting to the top. It was about how do you do it elegantly, how do you do it efficiently? And in particular, how do you solve the context problem in front of you? Because mountains are constantly changing, constantly morphing. The situation is not what you think when you start on a mountain uh, climb. It is how you sort of solve the problem as you go in an efficient, skilled way. I also grew up in, a, in an area that's become really obviously important to some of my work. I, and fascinating to me as a kid, I grew up in a high, a high extraction industry area of mining, logging, and farming. And in particular, logging and mining were um, important. These are large infrastructure um, systems that are actually designed using the nature of the place they were located. So our ancestors didn't necessarily have a grid they learned how to use the hydraulics or the gravity or the geometric sort of mechanic advan mechanical advantage of what we call the seven simple machines. And as a kid, I was absolutely fascinated with these, with these systems. And, um, they, uh, they have huge influence on, on some of the architecture I'm doing at this point. Not that they are architecture, but that they sort of uh, developed the ideas that I wanted to explore in, in architecture. I was also lucky uh, to grow up in a, in a time of, of the hot rod, uh, kind of the, the, the more uh, sort of neighborhood hot rod culture. Virtually everybody in our neighborhood, I was too young for this, uh, but every, virtually everybody in our neighborhood uh, built hot rods. And again, um, I observed, I was a voyeur, I participated in some, some of the hot rods, but, but really I never built my own hot rod. But what I saw were these individuals, which I think are, are, are artists at heart. I mean, uh, Ed Big Daddy Ross in the upper left-hand corner, and, and below him, Tommy, uh, Tommy Ivo. You know, just they were sort of protagonists in a car culture. They were the people out there taking a commodity and repurposing that commodity in their own sort of vision. I don't particularly find, you know, Big Daddy Ed Ross uh, Bandit a particularly attractive car uh, or skilled uh, design, but what it is, and this is what I think is important, he took this commodity, or a commodity called a car, and he repurposed it and he reinvented it. It's still a car, it still works, but he made it in sort of a, a personal vision. Upper, um, upper right-hand corner is a, is a highbrow artist uh, that's very well known, a guy named Jean Pagny from uh, Switzerland. And as a kid, I was lucky enough to grow up around uh, some of his work. But what he did was he kind of made a point, which I think is a really important point, that sometimes the craft that people discard as lowbrow art, like hot rods, is actually as highbrow as highbrow art. And I've always appreciated his message that he, back in the 60s, was trying to say, 
about um, high brow and low brow arc. And then in the lower uh, right hand corner, um, I go to the salt flat sometimes and I see these purpose built pot rods. These are guys that are not building them with uh, any sort of computer modeling. They're basically assuming and uh, intuitively understanding some of the forces that, that, you're deal that they're dealing with. And some of these structures are some of the most beautiful structures. Um, now, and they weren't, they weren't started out, he, this, group, <laughs> this group here did not start out to make a beautiful thing. They made a thing, a purpose-built object that would build about approximately 550, possibly 600 miles an hour uh, using piston-driven engines. So this is a, you know, a record holder, or I guess potentially a record holder. Um, they haven't run it yet, but they're still experimenting. Sort of, it was this un unbelievable craft, unbelievable sort of shaping of the, the converging sort of vectors um, that are um, geometrically more difficult at 500 and 600 miles. You know, I was lucky to work, uh, grow up around artists. These are all influences. They, you know, I look back on this and I go, how lucky could I be to grow up with Rudy Audio, uh, Ed and Nancy Keenholz, and in particular, the guy on the right-hand side, um, Harold Blaze. You know, hardest working person I've ever met. I, I'm actually hard working also. That's the only way you, this, this profession works is if you work harder than anybody else. Well, Harold worked harder than me. He was an artist. He fed a family. Um, and um, he did it in a, um, a, low, uh, a city a lot like Des Moines. Uh, not necessarily completely um, engaging art as a, as, a, uh, as a profession, but he changed that little, that little village of I grew up with Spokane, Washington, and, and in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Um, and it's something I learned from Harold because I was actually around Harold when he was building these sculptures and I actually helped him on, on some of these sculptures. And he felt an artist actually had to build their own work because as you build your own work, just like the hot rodders, you make the nuanced changes of what's happening in front of you. So, and, and I think, unfortunately, maybe in our profession, we're sometimes losing that ability to do those nuances that are so important to the experience of some of the buildings that we're designing because of, because of the way the group is uh, sectioned off in the departments. Um, our office, we only hire people that are interested in going from, and we want people to draw. Obviously, they have to be computer literate. But we want people to draw and be interested in design and skilled at design, but also the technical aspects and underpinnings of architecture and the construction administration of architecture. So if you're on a project in our, in our office, you're working on the project from beginning to end. There's no design department, technical department, spec department, or construction administration. We're old school in that regard, is that we expect everybody to make design decisions based on experience in the construction administration world. This is a final photograph um, to just make a, a kind of a point that I discovered over time what was important to me, and I think this is really important to students that are trying to develop um, a voice and develop maybe a reputation. Um, this, is a, this is a cabin I grew up around as a kid uh, in the early 60s, um, designed by Royal McClure, who my dad worked for when he was... Uh, when he came up from uh, uh, California to work with an architect. And Royal was a trip with architect, obviously. I mean, in, in 300 square feet, he does more architecture uh, than most of us do in our entire career. I mean, he has Prospect Refuge, uh, plain line, volume. He has, uh, he has a, a sequence of, of horizontal to vertical relationships to the landscape sort of figured out in this little, what was basically just a family shelter on a on a um, on a lake in uh, northern Idaho, and I remember I remember sort of thinking about this project as maybe one of the most influential projects of my career. And then it's 300 square feet, and maybe 100 square feet of it's actually enclosed. So what did that say to me? That said to me that small architecture can be as influential as large architecture. In fact, maybe it can be more influential, certainly to a career. What I developed, and you notice on all these projects, that are some, and these are only part of them, a lot of these projects are relatively small projects. I'm still doing small projects because I find them to be learning labs, uh, re research and development, thinking of uh, uh, places where I can think about things that if I was working on a 15-year project, first of all, I wouldn't even know if it was necessarily being built. That's frightening. 
But if I'm working on a lot of small projects, I know some of them are going to be built. All of them are going to be sort of uh, uh, in, a, in the cycle somewhere of design to construction. So I'm just learning as this sort of uh, juggling act with all these projects around me. And again, from, from my career, because I started relatively late, because I spent so much time in the mountains, is that all of a sudden I had a lot of projects that could be published, potentially win awards, could kind of get uh, my name out there with maybe a personal vision of what was important to me. I never totally understand why the architectural profession uh, in general is uh, sort of seduced by mega projects, which I find usually don't have a sense of humanity, a sense of scale, what it means to be a human being. Um, they feel like there's something missing. And for the most part, the projects that have that sort of scale uh, are done by architects that have never done residential architecture. Pretty shocking. Food, water, shelter. Residence is the most basic key, most basic building block of what we do every day. Yet the, the profession of architecture has basically forgotten it as the maybe, maybe the most important building block of our Glenn Merkett, I was really privileged to be, have, have some time with Glenn, and Glenn said that um, architecture, or residential architecture is the architecture that the profession has forgotten and has ignored, which I thought, wow, here's a guy, won the Pritzker Prize, enormous influence using residential architecture in a certain area. He didn't even travel, as you know. He only does work in his neighborhood. Um, and yet, he has unbelievable influence work we all do every day in offices, whether it's large scale or small scale. And the reason he says it's so important is basically the same thing I was saying, is that those people that understand residential architecture can actually begin to understand scaling up of larger and larger buildings and make them places people actually want to live in and use rather than just experience as a graphic on a you know, photograph or a, uh, or a sort of a flamboyant scale. In an urban, urban so that's about it um, on sort of the introduction of some of the influences. Hopefully when we have this loop on in back, when people are asking me hopefully provocative questions, I, I actually I absolutely want to embrace provocative questions, um, that the loop uh, at least indicates some of the things that I'm talking about uh, were uh, obviously, I, I hope, obviously highly influential on some of my work. So thank you for letting me talk about this. Which, which seat? Oh. And I'm hoping that you, we, you all have some questions out in the audience also. Oh, <laughs> we'll both go away. Something we noticed that we found sort of endlessly amusing, but also then maybe uh, deeply significant, is the fact that in, in over 90% of the images, uh, Tom is found leaning on, touching up against, almost always relying on his architectures. <laughs> and this, and this, uh, this relationship, <laughs> uh, this, this relationship between the body and the built which I think we all really value, uh, help to inform some of our questions. So, so the larger overarching question is, Tom, what is happening in the red circle? Uh, well, actually, that's a really that is a terrific question. I never realized this, and it's it's, it's actually um, 
sometimes so transparent. Um, so architecture is about the touch, really. And and oh, do I have? I've got a. I've got a. Am I still coming through? I'm not causing any feedback or anything. So architecture is about. Have you all read Yohani Palazma's book, um, The Hand? Eyes of the skin, thank you. And where he talks about the handshake with the building. That's where you touch touch the building. Probably one of the most important moments we all experience in any of our any of our projects. And it's one reason we do an accessory line, you know, of, of doorknobs and, and things that are more human in scale. And it's another reason that we, a lot of the work we do is residential, single family cabin, uh, multifamily, you know, it's the stuff of life. It's, how do you move your desk? How do you move a door? How do you how do you open a window? Why would you want to open a window? Why would you want to lean against something? Do you want to lean against that thing? Um, and, uh, I, and again, I'm, I'm a little, this is really terrific because I'm, I'm thinking, well, that's great that I'm leaning or touching or moving some piece of architecture. And I think you guys may remember there was that little girl that moved that uh, uh, window wall, I don't know, do you remember, did that video come up where, where she kind of comes out? Well, that's, that's, another, that's another way of touching a building, which is realize a building is actually not this magic thing, it's actually a tangible thing. So she's actually using just her little skinny arms. Um, and she's four and a half years old, um, and as I like to point out, she's got a broken foot, and she's moving six and a half tons of glass and steel. It's her little skinny arm strength that's, that's doing that. And it's, it's uh, something that comes ma maybe more from my physics background or interest in it. Maybe not everybody is interested in it, but um, it's just another way of engaging architecture, touching architecture, and sort of realizing it's not this dead thing, it's actually alive. So um, going off of that with your background in geophysics, um, as you mentioned in your opening statement, the active pursuit of other interests is essential. Can you go into a little bit greater depth on how you discovered architecture through geophysics? Ah, well, that's actually a really good question. Because again, my dad was an architect. Last thing in the world I wanted to be was an architect. So I actually avoided architecture. I didn't like the people in architecture. I didn't like, uh, you know, geez, are you kidding? I would hear things like uh, around my dad, well, your dad built our house. And I thought, no, he didn't. There was a whole bunch of people that were, <laughs> and my dad was not part of that group. And it, it was, there was sort of like a, a pretension about an architect or a position about an architect that I just didn't buy into as, as a kid. But I really enjoyed a couple of things when I was a kid. And as it turns out, I, I guess I actually enjoyed the architecture because I was influenced by Rawls, uh, who was a terrific person, actually. He was not part of that, that group I'm describing. But, we're artists uh, because I found, I knew I wouldn't be an artist. I knew that I wasn't so self-centered or self-absorbed that I could be an artist. I just felt like, wow, really? Just like every day you're, oh, you know? But, but I was around an artist that actually absolutely engaged that part of himself and still does. Um, but also he was interested in, in materials and the fabrication and the physics of those materials. So when I was working with all those large sculptures, here's Harold, kind of a strong guy, but he would do sculptures that would be uh, a little shorter than this, this screen behind me, but large sculptures that were probably in the 1,000, 2,000 pound range, and he would move them just using his smarts, his intelligence, his you know, pulleys, ropes, things like that, that was in, um, in screws sometimes, because you could just make slight adjustments, and I just was always fascinated with that brilliance of, um, of um, solving problems in front of you, but I also love the art part of it. So as I got, went into the physics part of it, I realized, A, I wasn't as clever in physics as I probably thought I was, and B, it felt like kind of like a dead-end place for me socially and culturally, you know? It uh, really, do I want to work for an oil company, and, you know, in the middle of Wyoming? I just sort of went through that, uh, it, it, like you all do as students, you go through that sort of moment and you think, wow, these are big decisions. And I slowly worked my way back to architecture because I think at, at its root, architecture is a terrific profession because you don't have to be an architect, but you're trained to think and you're trained to be um, smart about solving problems and working in, in groups. And you can go into this profession and you can go just virtually any, anywhere and be 
super productive. So I wound up in architecture. How did I wind up in architecture? I'm not sure, but I went into architecture because I knew what it was about was actually very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Do you still find inspiration in other fields of study today? I, well, I shouldn't say this out loud because only ma architecture magazines have been so good to me, um, <laughs> and um, and and they have been um, because that's the way the word gets out. But I tend not to read uh, architectural magazines. I tend, you know, maybe I'll go to the technical sections or I'll, or I'll you know, I'll skim through it. You know, after 30 years of doing this, you can actually see what's interesting and what is interesting pretty quickly. But I, I'm, I love science magazines. I love hot rod magazines. Uh, you know, I'll pick them up because I fly a lot. You know, I'll pick up magazines on the road. Uh, not so much political magazines anymore. I used to. I'm interested in financial stuff, uh, not as interested in, in poetry as I thought I would be, but you know, I'm just saying what I'm interested in. I, well, hopefully you guys are all interested in, in poetry and, and literature, but these are just evolving things, answering your question of what I'm sort of, um, what I've been reading more recently. Um, and it's not, but it's not designed necessarily, and it's not, or, or sort of what we would all recognize as Okay, so your work um, seems to celebrate human interaction with architecture. In your opinion, what's the significance of physically altering a space uh, as oh, opposed to pushing a, bu pushing a button? Super important, I think. Well, or pushing a button to alter a space. I don't even care if you push a button necessarily. Some of these projects, if you look closely, they're, they're actually motors. Uh, some of them are, and hydraulics. That, it makes it easier. Uh, the, the, the physical mechanics of moving something using your, your body, basically, as part of that machine is, is actually a little tricky. A motor or a hydraulics actually overpowers any sort of resistance that might happen. If you're just using your skinny, we're actually very fragile creatures. We're kind of pathetic. Really, and so we need we need all the help we can get. So the, the the accuracy and the geometries are really important when you're when you're doing it by yourself. But if, if motors are hydraulic, that's actually pretty easy. But that's not, that's only part of your question. What was the other part of the question? Oh, the interaction um, is important. So anyway, I'm fine with pushing buttons, things move, and uh, electronics go brr, whatever. Um, but I think it's more, uh, you know, it's more impactful and, and um, important if you do it by your hand or your body. The main point is architecture is about change. There are too many, at least when I was a kid, I won't name names, but there are architects out there that will put a building in a sort of a situation in a landscape and it's perfect day one and it slowly gets worse over day two, day three, day four, and then it becomes a maintenance item, it has to be pressure washed to kind of get it spruced up again um, to uh, you know, sort of its new state. I don't think, to me, that's not particularly interesting architecture. To me, the architecture that's most interesting is the architecture that sort of moves, you can move it, people will come in and, and change the shapes, and it actually ages. It actually gets better, hopefully, with time. Can I just, Piggyback on that question, this whole um, clear relationship for you between body motion, even light, actually, to be honest, it, it's part of that, part of that. So the temporal sequence, right? It's all in there. I, I, I just your background in, in mountain climbing, also that type of that type of art can be described as understanding the relation between body, mm -hmm. body movement, light, I mean, Absolutely. time. It, it, do, is this something that you've thought about, or is this just, I mean, the way you move has got to be informed by that, and how does that? So you're touching on a, a, a really interesting question, because um, I think I only realized the influence of those, those moments. You know, learning how to use the equipment around your body to solve a problem, and how to do it quickly so that you can, um, it, you know, it, it's like, well, potentially saving your life. It's kind of a crit critical thing. And um, you got to get better and better at it and be smarter and smarter about how, and because of the more time you spend on a mountain, the more dangerous it is. 
Well, that I always thought was over here, you know, in my experience. That was something I escaped architecture to do. So I, over now, when you get a little older and you get a little more reflective, that's why I was saying some things to you guys that you may not believe at this point. I certainly don't know if I would have believed it. But those things all of a sudden become, you think about them and they become more, you know, you, you realize how what you learned as a kid is so uh, is so important to how you um, how you operate as an adult, um, and especially in architecture. And so I'm just reflecting on that. I know I'm not smart enough to be like an academic to sort of understand how to describe it and why it happened. And um, I can just look back and go, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. Absolutely. And I'm not afraid. I'm I'm, I'm kind of naturally a risk taker. So th those movements, some of those movements are kind of risky movements, and um, I. Um, I'm willing to sort of engage them. That's just my personality. I sort of, uh, I don't want to risk everything, but, I just, but I'm not afraid of, of, of some risk. And uh, some of my clients aren't. You know, they're unbelievable. If you think about what they're risking. Well, first of all, a client, this is a, the risk situation is actually really interesting. Um, sometimes in our office, in every office, in everybody's career, they think, um, gosh, it wasn't my client. I could really be doing a good job there. Um, and, uh, it's it, sometimes that they can that can be a problem, but sometimes it can be un unbelievable inspirations too. They may say something naively, and you go, "Whoa!" and then you go off. It's like those of you that have been in juries, and you bring in a so sophisticated jury, and they look at one of your fellow students' project, and they go, "Unbelievable!" and you're going, "Huh? What?" It's something about what they've done uh, that, as a experienced and practiced practitioner or an academic, you recognize that is doing something uh, amazing. And uh, um, and that's only because you've got experience. It's only because you go, I lost my thought. <laughs> so I was on, on that other, what was, what was I? Oh, the risk. Risk. Right. Oh, totally. And clients will impact. And so this is what this is the point I was trying to make with clients was um, that uh, clients are risk takers. How many in this uh, in this office, <laughs> in this room, would do what a client would do? Ask yourself: Would you hire a bunch of yahoos? Yeah. Would you hire a bunch of people that you sort of know? Not totally. Maybe there's some published stuff out there with some awards, and you're risking thousands of dollars of fees, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of fees, and sometimes millions of dollars in uh, money, building something that you actually got to work in or live in. Would you do that? I mean, that's, that's what a client does. When a client comes to your front door, they're going, okay, here goes. And uh, that's an impressive person. Uh, with that, on the, the notion of the client, have you found that, that clients have come to expect these uh, ridiculous gizmos? Yeah. Uh, I, I always get that question, and it, it, I'm glad it's asked, because um, so the gizmo thing um, is a really personal thing that just comes from my background and my experiences. And um, of course, you, you start seeing other people starting to use these things. That's kind of cool, but it also indicates that, well, wait a minute. Um, there's no, I mean, I'm influenced by, obviously, Scarpa, I'm influenced by Sh uh, Shiro, I'm influenced by uh, Khan, you can just look at that deep influence, and Scarpa certainly had gizmos, you know, and, and Shiro certainly did with, with some of his smaller stuff, but they were deeply inspirational to me when I saw it, they kind of, they kind of gave me permission, in a way, to do these things. Um, the problem with them is, and this is a real problem, is uh, oh yeah well Cal actually we talked about this with Cal we have this one architect that is, is not a big fan of the stuff I I do um, and I won't name names but um, and uh, but it's local it's local politics kind of thing it says well the only reason Tom wins the award is because he has his hands wow really um, and fortunately I was you know supported in that discussion by Max Underwood out of University of Arizona 
said, no, look at plan section elevation. Are you crazy? I wasn't there. But I appreciated that because that's really the bottom line of architecture is plan, elevation, section, and how you guys all and me manipulate those sort of understandings of, of that music. Um, the gizmo thing becomes a gimmick thing if it is just like expected by a client. And sometimes I'll say, well, we're looking forward to our gizmo. And I'm going, oh, that's what you don't want to hear because that, that's a gimmick thing. And um, it really, the mechanics, they are a way of solving an issue maybe of taking architecture and maybe making it more extraordinary because of something that you want to do with the architecture, whether it's open the, the ceiling to the snow and the rain and, the, and the, the moon for a bath area, or if you want to open up the front end of the building to a big, beautiful landscape. In fact, that chicken point was actually because the client said, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if you could just get rid of the front end of the building and just live on that? And I go, oh, yeah, I can, well, let's give it a shot. So there's a, there's, a, there's a project that, you know, it was instigated in a way by the client saying something. And, you know, because of my background and, and sense of willingness to take risk and their willingness to take risk, we did something collectively as a group with the craftspeople and uh, Phil Turner, the engineer, huge risk. No one had really ever done that. Now all of a sudden this thing is published. Now you're seeing this thing show up uh, in other places. In fact, we've had exact copies of that made. And what they will use is the concrete block module in the back of the, the gear to basically establish the uh, engineering of the thing. And you're thinking, wow, you did reverse engineering. And you go, you spent that much time doing that rather than coming up with your own idea. Continuing with the gizmos, is there an iterative process to the gizmos? And I mean, how do you test usability? Well, that's actually another really good question. At this point, I've been doing them enough that there are some understandings of what works and what doesn't work. And there are some things that don't work. Um, and I actually try to talk people out of doing gizmos at this point. Um, um, because people will say, well, can we move this? Well, well, yeah, of course you can. But it's very expensive. And um, you know, you're actually, there's some risk involved. And, um, and they're actually fairly simple. I'm, I'm kind of overstating that, uh, that they're expensive or risky or um, they're not high maintenance at all. They're actually simple machines. They're very simple machines. But it's, um, I just, you know, it's like sometimes unnecessary. So I'm actually trying to talk to people about how uh, they have, uh, you can guess, and the architects in the audience, I always get a question, well, how do you weather strip that? And how do you put a, a bug screen. We have bugs here in Iowa, you know, and, and I'll, I'll hear that. Yeah, and I'll hear that in virtually every, and we have bugs all over, but um, there are some realities of moving big things that you have to embrace and accept that uh, it's not a perfect seal. And it has some, I don't want to bore you here. Oh, yeah, we had a question about. Have you ever given up an idea because the physics just didn't work or tried something too crazy, pushed it too far? Uh, the one that, um, nope, the, the one that's sort of similar to this one, um, we we had an idea of, uh, based on uh, basically your main line. Uh, you guys know what a main line is, but anyway. Uh, yeah, parallel rule, yeah. Uh, yeah, right in there was uh, slide, slide rules. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a double it's a double cable system, and we, we actually um, sort of, that one little tower where all four sides open and close at the same simultaneously. At one point, we actually had a transmission, a Ford transmission that had four gears, and we could basically go and, you know, anyway, that got too complicated. So we, we figured, okay, let's just do them all together. And, and what we failed to sort of uh, think about um, clearly were the friction forces of running all those cables around the, the halo of the building. and. Uh, Thank God, the owner of that building is basically a muscle with feet, and he has enough strength <laughs> that he can kind of move those four panels together. But that was that was one failure. I consider the 
consider a fa failure. The owner doesn't because he can actually move it. But it's it's too difficult to move, I think. And but I don't think we've ever I don't think we've ever been given a, we can move a house. There was one scheme where we actually moved a part of the house and the guest part of the house. So if you didn't like your guest, <laughs> you could move the guest. We never built that, but it was a relatively easy thing. It was a four horsepower engine. There's a cog a gear. So it was kind of, I don't, I, I think you can virtually solve any problem in the gearing. And can you talk a little bit about Phil Turner's uh, role in your design process? Huge role. So here's a here's a guy. Um, you know, you get to an age and you start going, "Hey, wait a minute, I'm not dead yet." You know, um, um, you know, because there's a youth culture. There's always a youth culture, and so um, there's sort of this assumption that as you get older, you're sort of less and less sort of bright, or less and less sort of interesting, or whatever. And uh, I actually, my, my mentor, Harold Blaze, is 84 years old. He probably is as young thinking um, as virtually anybody out, out there, um, and he's up on everything. He's very ill now because his, you know, as an artist, you're around these toxic materials most of your, and that was back in the day. When I used to work with Harold, and you know, I'd clean my arms off with toluene and xylene, and Harold did it all the time. Um, uh, and so he's 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 hurting right now, uh, but he um, Phil's another perfect example of that. Phil is now 75 years old. He's like a big kid. You can throw virtually any any sort of situation or issue towards him, and he just starts getting out, he gets out his little eight and a half grid of, of paper, and he just starts drawing the gizmos and the gears and the relationships, um, and he just starts solving, solving the problem on an eight and a half by 11 piece paper. He doesn't need, obviously, he doesn't know how to use a computer. In fact, I don't even, I think he only knows, like me, he only knows how to communicate on it. He doesn't know how to draw, obviously. And uh, the drawings are fantastic, these funky little, little diagram drawings. Um, so it is an iterative process. You know, Phil um, knows how to make things work mechanically, but sometimes that isn't necessarily maybe the best way to sort of do move the thing beautifully. I mean, that's I think why he likes working with it, is because those of us can't necessarily, those of us that can't necessarily solve the problem as precisely and geometrically as he can, we can come in with our own sense of structure and machine that brings ideas to him. And in addition to Phil, um, how do you find that both you and the partners of Wilson Kundig Architects uh, continue to challenge each other? Terrific question because one of the things that I don't know if it was clear or not, but if you look at our website, there's my partner's architecture is much different than my architecture, and uh, that's because you know I, Jim allowed me to sort of explore my own sort of direction, and I'm a complete supporter of, of Jim's direction. In fact, when I joined the firm, I recognized here was a guy during the postmodern years that was absolutely a modernist and convinced about his belief in what modernism meant. And I almost quit the architectural profession because of postmodernism. I was so disappointed in, in where it had led. I was actually semi-interested in Venturi, as I was saying to Cal this morning and a couple of others. But man, it was just the way it was used by the profession, I thought it was awful. But here was, here was Little Jimmy Olsen just out there just doing um, at, a, at all costs, you know, what he was doing. I thought, that's a partner. Somebody that's willing to sort of lay his neck out on the line and just believe in what he did and was doing um, and uh, persevered like a terrier. So um, I, you know, on your ankle. And um, so I did, you know, I, I joined the firm and uh, um, I guess I'm kind of a terrier too. And um, that was, it all kind of worked out. So we are very different. In fact, we're going to Miami with, uh, and Pilar Velades is going to talk about that. It's called Convergence, whatever it is, this, this intersection between two very different personalities that absolutely um, are kind of uh, competitors, but not really. You know, like each of us inform each other and, and help each other with our work. To compl he's completely generous with, with my work, and I'm completely generous with him. In fact, sometimes, He'll get phone calls and he'll say, mm -hmm, I think you're better with Bob than you'll be with me. I do the same thing. 
So the firm is a weirdo. One thing I didn't talk about is we are a group of misfits. Basically, we are people that don't fit into corporate firms. Everybody in the firm, I don't think, uh, would fit into the corporate firm. And so this this sort of group of misfits, depending on you know what your interests are, sort of become mutually supportive of each other. So even though you're 120 people, and you've got some of the political issues and some of you know all that usual stuff in the group, yeah, fundamentally there's an energy and a willingness to throw yourself on hand grenades for other people. And, uh, that's, the that's the way the plan works so far. Knock on wood, uh, who knows um, how much longer, but it's been great. Because all that means is the work begins to diminish because you can't, unless it's coming from your heart, and even though people like the work of Jim's or like the work of, of mine, uh, they're not me and they're not Jim, and we sort of recognize that. So. What we're trying to urge people to do is find your voice, and this is tricky. This is the tricky part, is how, does, how do you let people in the office find their voice if they're working for you on projects and you're still out there with your own voice? That's kind of tricky because what you're doing is you're trying to transition um, people sort of building their careers and let them not have to start their own firm because Starting a firm is tough. I started a firm in Alaska where, um, you know, you just start, you're actually working in the living room, you have no Xerox machine, you have no, you know, have no systems. It's really kind of expensive and you're doing decks and bathroom remodels and kitchen remodels. Is there a way to hand over the keys to a firm that actually at this point has enough reputation that you can still go out and search for those cool small projects, those cool big projects and get them and let other people begin to have their own voice and change the voice of the firm. One of the issues for us is whether um, the firm name continues with the next group. Um, in a way, we don't want to, you know, because that's, that's a, there's an identity to the firm maybe at this point, because of maybe Jim and I were, you know, heads of the pin, but at some point, we're not there, so you you don't want you don't want to work for somebody dead. If that makes sense to you, you want to work for a kind of a live thing, something that actually is um, evolving. So that's a long answer to a really difficult question. Do we have the answer? No, we just know what we don't. I think it would be actually good at the moment to to see if, uh, if there is any questions we want to bring in from the audience, you know, as well. Yeah, please ask. Yeah. See you. So that's a that's a terrific question yeah. because the, where the question is, I'm going to repeat the question. Yeah. So oh. you know, the, the you know, yeah, or just or, uh, with the small projects, is that a and just make sure I'm, an, I'm sort of paraphrasing you correctly. In small projects, is that a place for what I said, research and development R and D or whatever? Is that where I'm research and developing mechanical systems or delivery systems of the of the of the, um, the project or design? Is that fair? Yeah, it's all of the above. And so right now, I'm focusing on what everybody knows is uh, the, the evolution that's happening between the architectural drawings and the fabrication drawings. Um, so where is that going? No one knows, totally. There's a lot of mistakes being made right now on large projects, but if you're on small projects and there's an understanding of a small project and the risk involved, you can begin to sort of experiment with, uh, this is actually a pretty good example, because we actually sent our Revit drawings to the uh, fabricator of this um, gearing system, and we are now working with one of uh, Phil's uh, students, and our drawings are becoming closer and closer to the fabrication shop drawings, so there isn't that 
iterative process, reiterative process. That's a real time crunch and a real drag to in communication uh, between the fabricators and the designers. So that's happening with mechanical systems. That's happening with structural systems. That's happening with me uh, mechanical like gear systems and also HVAC systems, um, window systems to some extent. Um, design delivery, what's the best way, you know, as I get older, I have to be quicker about how I deliver an idea or a, a scheme. I mean, that's just the nature of nature, basically, that as I get busier and busier, I have, I have only limited, I can't scale up beyond 24 hours a day. And I have to be able to sort of uh, learn how to, uh, this is the project in 1986 that kind of was, was a life changer for me, where I finally realized I was a, a, a relatively mature architect. I was 38 years old, getting an idea of the time we're talking about. So um, I hope that kind of answers the question. That's one great thing about small projects. I learn about craftspeople. I learn about systems. I learn about, well, we, we worked with this terrific group up in British Columbia called Spearhead um, on small projects, and then we use them on, we're using them on larger and larger projects. So they're learning. We're learning. It's a terrific argument. You'll notice some of them are pretty big windows. Um, there, well, is a technical issue. Um, the smaller windows are actually. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't want to get into this, but there's a reason sometimes for the smaller windows. Historically, the small windows were because glass had to be transported, um, and it would break, right? And so you, it would be small pieces that would break, and you could replace them relatively easily. Um, for years, um, in fact, the, the the, what was the uh, the dining hall we were in, uh, Saranen, in the Drake campus? Huge sheets of glass, and I looked at them and go, oh boy, those are the good old days. Those can't be insulated sheets of uh, glass. And I said, oh, they are insulated. And I just as I was saying it, I, I said, I wonder if they have, and sure enough, they had a seal problem in one of the insulated glaze. Because when you have big sheets of glass, you have all these um, temperature, you know, the sun will hit on top and it'll be cold down below. Immediately it starts changing and it breaks the seal. In fact, there's a, there's a project out in, you know, the, the concrete block project with the garden in front of it. it has the largest pieces of glass you can still get. They had to be shipped out from the East Coast. I think they are 8 by 12 feet, something, maybe 8 by 10, I've forgotten now. So that was... That's as big a piece of glass, and it was quite expensive to get that glass. One sheet of that glass literally exploded, um, and the owner was in the house. And the reason it exploded is the sun angle, it was, it's in Idaho, it was minus 20 degrees outside, which is a winter in Idaho. The sun hit it at the top third of it, just a line in the, in the glass, and it just immediately changed the temperature of that part of the glass, and the thing just kaboom. So one, if you want big um, walls of glass, kind of the ideal size is probably three feet by seven feet. That, or, or maybe, well, that's actually a, a relatively tall shape and it has some physical issues. Probably a glass manufacturer would be just love it if you did four feet by three feet, something like that. Because there isn't a bunch of little things, but it's kind of the right size. So when you get into something like glass, you are actually really dealing with a lot of um, issues. And depending on if you want a wall of glass or small pieces or tall pieces, the proportions um, are super important. Obviously, proportions are really important to us and our work. Um, Jim's work is all about the nuance proportion. Brings up an interesting issue. We were talking a little bit about this earlier. There is no question, and I'll uh, make this public statement again, there is no question that computers hurt our office's ability to put out the nuanced proportions that we did before we had AutoCAD in that case. 
Now, of course, it's Revit, totally Revit-based. Um, there's, there's an interesting dilemma we all have, and I don't want to come off like a Luddite, like, oh, in the old days, we had better fit and finish and better proportions. Problem is, it's true, and I'm saying that about <laughs> it. I'm saying that is, that's, that's our work, you know, and I have to just be honest. You know, I walk into some of these things, I go, and I, and I think it was because, you know, as we were drawing it, we were aware of the floor plan. We actually um, were, as we were drawing a detail, we were kind of aware of sort of the larger issues because now our screens are relative, even our big screens are relatively small to the, to the proportion of the drawing. It's just a reality of, of the tools. It's back to my mountain climbing analogy. As I got better and better in climbing, my tools got better and better and better, and I was able to do better and better work. AutoCAD, Revit, they're still thuggish kind of materials. At some point, they're going to be terrific. I mean, it's obviously we're, we're, we're signed up for it. We will be. It's just the reality at this time in the evolution of architecture, it is suffering and uh, continues to suffer. It's getting better and better and better, but um, it's a reality. It's, it's just a reality of some of those proportions. I had an old guy once say something to me that I, um, that I didn't believe, and it was... Uh, uh, you know, I was drawing on my floor plans, uh, which, incidentally, floor plans are not trained very uh, well anymore. I mean, it seems like, you know, the floor plan, I mean, you, kids come out of school and the floor, the ability to sort of read floor plans and understand floor plans, I don't know if that came because, yeah, well, oh, absolutely. Well, clients, clients will use SketchUp. Wait till you see that. Because <laughs> it, it's that easy, right? Um, the, uh, but there is, but there's a loss. There, there's, I was drawing a plan and this guy named Frank Stark came up and he goes, you're not an architect until you start drawing lines and you understand that line, not just in the two dimension, set, uh, two dimensions, but in the third dimension and volumetric, um, tectonically, you understand what, what you're drawing. I didn't believe it. And actually, it turned out that that's absolutely true. So when I draw, now I draw a line for, it took me many, many hours of drawing lines. I began to sort of understand the building just with the lines I was drawing. I didn't believe them. I don't expect you guys to believe them, but it was kind of this amazing transformation. And I think that's something that's maybe sort of missing now with computers is that you're not able to feel the building. I can guarantee something to you. I can look at your floor plan you may not believe it, but I can actually feel your building that you're designing. And it's hard to believe at this point, I know it is, but you can just, I mean, you do it long enough and all of a sudden, it's just like when you're in sports, right? All of you that are really good at some sport, you know how you just sort of understand what's going on. You, or music, music is a perfect example. Jazz musicians, unbelievable musicians, they're talking to each other and they're building something. They're, this is not just you doing a bunch of scales, and you're actually in conversation, um, but with a um, with a, a set of plans, sections, and elevations. I can actually feel the building, and um, right now I'm not always sensing that the kids who are smarter than me, more talented than me, are able to feel the feel the building. That's just a publicly state. I may be totally wrong, but it's just my sense. Actually, I'm uh, going to let, uh, let the two of you kind of pick, pick one last question each, um, and, and then we're going to uh, have to call it but Oh, good. I got a long question, so I don't think really steamy. So when looking at the leadership of Olson Peden Architects, it seems that you in particular have a very spiritual connection with the landscape. How do you communicate that connection to your staff, 120, and your partners? You know, I think it's just because the people we hire have that connection to the landscape. There's just an understanding. And it's not the natural landscape, it's a context landscape. You know, people always think, oh, you do these buildings and the big, beautiful landscape. Well, everybody's got big, beautiful landscapes around them, but it, it, I hope people realize that I'm doing buildings in Manhattan. That's a landscape. That's a cultural landscape. That's a natural landscape. Um, and um, I think the people we, uh, I'm just kind of, uh, 
but I think the people we tend to hire, it's like an intuitive response. We're, we're um, maybe not as good as we used to be, but we used to have a real understanding of what that person's sort of intuition is about design. And where we get it is in their drawings. We can almost immediately um, see the way a person draws, the way a person sort of thinks with a pencil, even though they're unbelievably skilled with the computer. We have people in the audience, uh, in the, um, in the uh, firm that just, <laughs> they're magicians. In fact, they should be working for Pixar, or they should be working for, um, you know, gaming. Um, they make a lot more money. Um, but, um, but, you know, they want to be do building, but they can just, you know, just, it's just like a proportional thing. It's like what they do. And that's what we used to hire. We used to hire only people that knew how to draw. And it doesn't necessarily have to even be a coherent drawing. It's just the way you can see the group. And those people seem to have sort of this landscape sense, this sort of concept, uh, uh, context sense that um, all intuition, nothing, nothing quantifiable. Yeah, and I sort of wanted to follow up on that. And you hit on it a little bit, but the difference between the landscape and the city. You've done now urban projects like the, the art stable is one. How how do those landscape sensitivities emerge again? In, you know, when you're surrounded by buildings and that. It, it's a good question because it, because they, there are different answers, but they're the same question. You know, you're dealing with a context. You're dealing with public, private, um, uh, uh, prospect refuge, proportions, what's happening, climatic, uh, cultural. You're dealing with all of those issues. These are all these physics are called vectors. There are all these vectors that you're dealing with. They're the same question. They're just different answers that you're, you're dealing with. And then your your skill as an architect is to take those answers and make a response to them um, that in the best sort of poetic way. I mean, that's the beauty of architecture. It doesn't necessarily give you the ultimate architectural convergent answer, if that makes any sense. It's your skill of taking all of these issues and exploring all those issues and then making architecture. I don't think there's one answer. There's not one best answer. I don't, some people argue there's one best piece of architecture. I, I don't think I think everybody comes at it with their own DNA, client's DNA, the issues that are quantifiable, and um, the moment in time, whatever that moment is. That's the role of Thank you. Oh, you've already done that.